Okay. Well, hello. Good morning. Um, welcome to our release recap for September 2023. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm going to be talking about the USAS releases first, and um, then we'll roll into the next topic. But um, I'm on the release recap page already. Uh, I did get here from the main page to the SSD team meetings and trainings page, and then to the release recap. So um, so what I have here for USAS is uh, there were two regular releases this month. So we had um, 8.81 and 8.82. And uh, the bug fixes are pretty quick here. The um, first one is this five-year forecast uh, data tab was modified to remove the beginning balance calculation. Um, but basically, the prior year's ending balance is now being used to populate the next fiscal year beginning balance. Um, basically, it's going to all look the same at the end of the day um, because that ending balance and beginning balance are the same. But um, there was just like one was being calculated. I don't know if it was necessarily like being calculated differently, but um we came across this for one like very specific situation um, that had to do with a prior year. And that's what kind of brought this up. So the team said, okay, for consistency, we're going to go ahead and just, you know, make sure that it's always going to be the same balance for that reporting. And then this other one, um, it, it says a problem causing the creation of the code of the code custom field to um to fail has been corrected and i looked into the jira issue for this one because it didn't sound that familiar to me and um this was something on like the dev side on the development developer side like i don't think this is anything that um has actually impacted any districts it was more so um looks like something that was discovered in like their testing phases and um so just making sure that that that's all corrected and working properly And, you know, I realized I like totally jumped right in here to start talking about USAS. But of course, if anybody has questions along the way, please let me know. Um, let us know as we go. Or um, if you want to put them in the chat, uh, that would be great. So <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just started rolling right in. <laughs> okay. So uh, next, I'm going to talk about improvements. And like, this is really the... Um, the bulk of what I have for you today for the USAS side. So the first thing is that we updated the description for the forecast line number um, to be state share of local property taxes per ODE. This was a ODE dictated change. And uh, where this happens, so this is on the five-year forecast grid. So under periodic, this five-year forecast grid here. And if I scroll down a little bit, it's any of these account codes that are associated with the um, 1.050 uh, forecast line number. And really, it, it's just a description change. So it's just changed to say state share of local property taxes um, as far as that. This is also updated, like if you were to extract the file to CSV or to Excel, uh, the description will be updated there as well. Okay. And then um, also, so this one, we improved the usability of the AR billing view uh, to allow the item description and customer data to fully display. I believe we had quite a few requests for this one. So um, hopefully this is something that um, the users are really gonna like now having this updated. Um, Basically, this box right here was expanded, and let's go to, so this is an accounts receivable. So for any districts that use accounts receivable in the billing section, uh, when you like view or create or edit um, a billing, the fields that we're talking about here is first the customer field. So this is widened so I can see all of my customer information pick one of those and then down here when we go to actually add um, the items to this transaction this description field right here so um it the 
the box kind of didn't extend down for it before so so um you have plenty of room to type and um be able to see what they're putting in there i know there are some different things that have been mentioned over time i think like um like maybe e-rate was one of them where you know there's like a specific description that you have to have for that um and then i click something on here but let me show you okay so here's what we're going to do we're going to copy this as this is from the billings um page but let me do this um we're gonna make it even longer one <laughs> So if I come in here, let me put in this and then let's put it in again for good measure and put it in again. So um, this is the uh, this is what I wanted to show is when you have more information, even just in this box, you do have a little scrolly bar now. So um, even if it is longer than even just this view, like it still can be easily like viewed and seen within um, the item. So uh, the full length of characters that's available there is now 3,000. So the there was like a character limit as well that um, people were running into. So that has been uh, greatly extended. So hopefully that can accommodate every, you know, all of those really long descriptions that they have. Um, and then the last thing that I have for you, Sass, is um, we... Uh, the team has been working on creating these rust controllers. And again, this is something that is um, just being worked on in the background and for future use. So this is not anything that you'll see a change to right now. Just know that like this is something that work is being done on. You know, this is where um, some of our time is going. And so we put this on here to just kind of track that um, these were also included. So um, and these kind of correspond to like the different pages in the software. Okay. Any questions on the USAS part? All right. Well, I'll get it passed over to USPS then. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Okay. Um, there we go. I'll make sure you can see my screen. Okay. Let's see. September. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I'm not seeing You're it. You're not seeing it? Okay, let me. There it is. Back up. Okay, thanks, there Amanda. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, welcome to Friday, uh, Fridays with Fisco. Um, we're going to be going through the payroll side of the releases we had for September. Uh, the first ones will be, um, I had one on September 8th, which was a regular um, um, release, 7.0. Then we had the 7.0.1, which was a hot fix. And that's the um, September 11th one. And then September 22nd, we had the 7.1, and that was a regular. So the first ones we'll be going through are the uh, bug fixes. Um, the first one, um, they kind of improved a little bit was um, when districts are running the converting personal leave to sick leave. Um, if it was like, if an employee had a 0.5 personal day, it was zeroing it out um, or go negative. And what they actually wanted it to, it should do is it should carry over into the personal leave and then nothing to sick if it was under one. So again, that's here. Now, again, they want to make sure that they include that partial sick days if it's a half day. If it's a half day left and they include that, then that half day will be carried over to a personal leave and then nothing will happen to sick. So it would just carry over if they had that include partial day. If they didn't, it would just zero out that 0.5 and nothing would happen. Now, if the employee had a 1.5 PL day left and they are carrying one over to personal leave, and then it would carry the 0.5 would convert to sick. So again, that should start, uh, work now according to actually how it should have been in the first place. So the other one is the bug um, a district found when they were um, was introduced during the 7.0 release. Um, they were trying to view the payroll payments in the highlighter 
and also in the employee dashboard, and it was throwing an error as soon as they were trying to view those um, payroll um, payments. So that has been fixed. Um, some districts probably didn't even notice it because um, it probably got fixed before they were actually viewing it. Um, the other bug was a district found when they were trying to create a code in custom fields definition, um, they were getting an error right away. So again, um, this was just one district that saw that and um, we were able to fix that. Um, down to the improvements. Um, the next improvement is how the compensations are reading the job calendars. Um, so now when um, a calendar stop date is entered, this is determining how the days are paid in a payroll, how many days are gonna be paid. So now when they have a calendar stop date entered on compensations, this is how um, it's gonna determine how that employee should be paid. So if they enter a calendar stop date that is prior to that payroll begin date that they want to stop and they have money for that next payroll to be accrued, it will all come out, excuse me, it will be all come out of accrued paid now. So it's not going to show regular wages. It's going to show the accrual and then it's going to say no work days. So again, um, they're going to want to make sure your districts have the correct stop date entered Um because recently I just had one that um, the calendar stop dates were entered for 2023 for their fiscal year 24 and no work days are being calculated or SERS days. And, and it was being paid all out of ACC because they had the 2023 stop date center um, this district did. So they're going to want to make sure that those stop dates are correct now because it is looking at the calendar stop date. The next thing is the update was made to the employee dashboard. Um, this was behind the scenes. They just moved the um, the pictures, the employee photos from the custom fields to a new employee photo entity. So that was just done behind the scenes. I didn't even notice the change. Uh, the next one was they added um, back the EMIS changes for fiscal year 24. Now that everybody should be done with fiscal year 23 um, EMIS reporting, they reverted those changes back that they um, had to remove on the 6.97 release. So now under position, they have disabled the high and low grades. This is only for EMIS reporting. It will return no value. Now, again, that's still there. So the districts can use that, those fields. For their use, it's just not returning any value anymore to EMIS. It's no longer needed. The next one was um, they completely removed the extended ser service element um, that has been removed altogether from this um, um, from the screen. So districts shouldn't see that anymore. The next one is the name, prefix, and suffix. This is no longer required for EMIS reporting. Again, it's still there. They can use it because I think it's used for um, W-2 purposes and su such like that um, if they need it. So again, it's just EMIS reporting is no longer using it. The next one is the fund source sources that have been removed. So they removed the J and the X. Those are no longer there. And then they did an update just to the name of the I, which is the state property based assistant funds, and then to dis and they changed it to to um, disadvantaged pupil impact aid. Those are the changes for the EMIS. The next one was the validation only occurs um, when they're running the W two C. Um, when they were running the W two C, they were getting an error. when they were creating it. So if I was creating a record, I'm just gonna create one. It was stating that you couldn't save it without the social security number, even though you're not correcting your social security number, you, you might have to, I mean, some districts might have to, but if they're not, now they can save that and it's not gonna throw error because before it would say, have to have the social security number entered. So it's gonna look at the previous social security number. So now they no longer have to have that in there. So they don't have to worry about that error popping up anymore. So now the next one, 
Um, I think districts are really going to like this one. This is the add and save and recall um, for the perimeters of the payroll initialization of the pay groups, which is um, under when you're running payroll. So again, um, I'll go ahead and do a test here. So as you can see, I already had saved mine. So let me get back out of here. I act like I didn't even select those. Okay, so everything's back to normal. So again, when you're going in and you're having your, um, entering your dates, my June is open. So I'm just gonna use June 15 as my date. And that'll be my first date. Twenty-three. So now you can go ahead and select which ones are going to be in your regular start and stop dates. If you have that, if you use that, if you use, if you don't, and you just want to um, not have to worry about pulling these over all the time, you can select them all. And then you can do a save and, and save um, one that's just for your normal pay. Like I'll just do normal or something which I already have, but, and then you can save that. So now when you reinitialize re the next time, they're all automatically gonna pull up over there all the time. Now, if you have one that are split, so I'll go back out, get those all back over. Okay, so I'm gonna select maybe the first, these are my normal pace. So now we have the six one, which is matches your stop, start and stop date. And we're going to add the date range for my next selection of pay groups. Again, you can have as many, you know, if districts have three different start and stop dates, they can. Now you're going to enter in what your next date is. So I'll just go ahead and enter. These are from here to here. There we go. So the only thing districts will have to remind remember is when they're first setting this up and saving it, it's going to clear these dates here. So again, if I put in, this is my test one pay. And this is how it's ran every payroll. You can go ahead and add that and save it. So now it's gonna be saved for the next time you um, initialize payroll. But the only thing you're gonna remember, see how it removed the dates? It removed these. So they just gotta remember that they just, after they save it, just to go ahead and just re um, enter that those dates right back in real quick. That's all they have to do for that first time. Now they won't have to do that again because they're not gonna be saving it again. It's just that first time setup. They have to remember that. And then initialize the payroll. So if I go back in and I initialize another payroll, you see the date, it's all set up now. So I can go in there and do my test one pay. And then those are my, um, what I had for that one I just saved. Again, I just have a couple of them different. So and then once you enter these dates in here for the regular, it automatically um, puts it in there for that one. Because these are because these always that first section will always use these regular days. And then here you have to enter in your own. And again, you don't have to save again because you already have your pay groups unless something changes and you have to update your pay groups. Then you will have to uh, resave it. And then again that will clear this figure out, re-enter it, and then initialize payroll. Any questions on that part of it? Okay. All right, we'll move to the next one. The next one is, um, they just did a pop-up under the configuration for EMIS reporting. They just did an update on that. So now when they um, hover over that, it just states the ZID prefix as assigned to your IRM by the Department of Education and Workforce. 
Um, I think we had a request from a district or ITC that wanted that cleared up. The next one is the report, um, a district notice that when they were adding adjustments and then on the direct deposit notices or check stubs that the adjustments were being added here plus in the regular amount. So this was throwing off employees thinking that this amount wasn't correct, which it wasn't because it was, um, I think it was adding in both, I think. So now when they do adjustments, it will show the amount of the adjustment, but then it's going to show zero for a year today. It's not, a key, not going to keep a running total. That amount will be automatically just added in the regular payroll item, the normal one year-to-date amount, just so it doesn't cause confusion. Okay. Okay, any questions on in the improvements? Okay, we'll move on to the new features. Um, we did um, get the mass load for attendance and absence corrected. Because um, I know a lot of dis some districts use this instead of the uh, the import for attendance, they like to use the mass load instead. So now that is corrected. So now they can use this um, if they like, and they shouldn't have any problems anymore. So if they go to the mass load under utilities, mass load. You will see two sections here. I have it here. Then also you can go here. So if you click here, this has about the same information, um, what it does under the mass load section of the attendance. It's just, it doesn't have the, all the, um, where's it, did I hear it is? Doesn't have what the identifying fields or optional fields under this one here. So again, um, you can click here and that'll take you right to the mass load, which I was just then. And then it also shows um, what if you're doing an add and if you're doing a modify to attendance, we have actually templates out here that they can use now for that. And you can click here for um, the attendance modify, or you can do if you're adding an attendance and absence. And again, it can be all on the same CSV spreadsheet. They don't have to be separate, one for absence, one for attendance. Okay. And I did already bring this up on one. So here is the adding of the attendance. And again, it here is the example of your headers that you need and what they should look like and how they should be entered. Like the date needs to be the 2023-08-25. So year, month, date. And then here's an example of the modify one. That over here. And what you need if you're modifying. And again, if you're modifying, you need to have that ID. And you can find that in the grid under more to pull that um, ID in. So you can just copy and paste it into here if you need to modify an absence or attendance. So where I say we're defining that, if you go under attendance, find that ID. Under more ID right here, that's what you need. This is only if you're modifying one. And then there's that ID that you would need. And that's where that, that would need to go right here in order to recognize which one you're trying to update. Okay. Um, let's see, one other thing. Where, where are we at here? There we go. And then once they do that, then you go to the utilities mass load you choose the file that you're um, uploading, and then you're gonna choose the attendance journal from the in, um, importable entities. Okay, so that is where you would 
have to make sure you, and it's just attendance, not absence, attendance, it's just attendance, but that it's for both. So just a reminder on that. Okay. Um, if you're using just the regular mass load, um, excuse me, the mass load um, documentation. Again, we have the other optional fields here that they can add. Again, those spreadsheets that I showed you just show the ones that are um, that are needed in the file, and then they can add these um, other ones if they need to update those. Okay. The next one is, um, Create, we created the eligibility to retire report, which was um, a big one for districts. So this is, has been done now. And if you go to reports, eligibility to retire. So here you will see, again, you can do a save and recall. If you wanna save the um, name of the report, um, again, you can run this report by CSV, PDF, or Excel. You can run it by employee number, name. Again, you can re re um, run it by retirement system and then by employee number, and then retirement system by employee name. So you have a different options to sort by. The include... Um, only include employees who are eligible to retire. Again, if you don't want to run it for all employees, you can run it just for employees that are going to be eligible coming up. So when this is checked, the report will only include what you have on the mark. So if you only have um, selected SIRS or SIRS, because that's one of your options, again, it depends on the requirements for the retirement eligibility that is shown on the report. And then if you have that included, we'll go ahead and check that. You can also conclude archive employees if you want to. And then again, we have the option, if you're only running this report for SERS employees or STRS employees, if you leave it blank, it's going to include all employees. And again, if you wanna um, find out maybe one employee is asking or you're questioning an employee, you can find that employee name, search it and add it. If you leave it blank, it's going to search for everyone. So I'm going to run a report and just include ones that are eligible because I did run one earlier. So here is what the report will look like. So these are employees that are only eligible. Now I ran one earlier before we started. Now this one I left the um, that field unchecked. So now you can see there's all employees and it shows um, that information. So it's pulling in everybody that is eligible or not. So again, up to the district, if they want to do a check and make sure all these uh, total experience or fields are um, inputted correctly um, on their employee screen, they can do that. And I wanted to show in the documentation too of how we are how we are finding these. Where we are? There we are. How this report is determining who is pulling in. And down here at the bottom, you see how do we determine that? So the age of the employee on the report is determined by using the current date and the birth date of the employee from the employee view. So it's um doing the calculation for you for the date, for the age. Also, retirement system, system district experience, and total years experience are all based off the employee screen, what is entered there. So again, if they want to pull, get this, um, start running this so they can make sure that everybody has their information entered in correctly, they can do that. Um, to exclude archive employees, leave on check. Again, this is includes archive employees. So this is looking at the employee archive or unarchived. The report will include all active and non-active positions for the retirement system. So this also depends on how the include archive employees define. So again, this is going to look at your all active and non-active positions in that retirement system. But if you have that um, include archive employees checked, 
it will also include those archived employees. Um, the eligibility for retirement columns, this is that 60 years, um, five experience, five years of experience, the 55 years with 25 years experience, and then only 30 years of experience, no matter age, no matter of your age. So when it's determining this, it's going to look at, um, for example, if a 60 year old employee, this employee only has five years in the total years experience column but only has two years in the district's experience, they will be flagged as eligible because they made that 60 years with five years experience. Another one would be maybe a 57 year old employee that has 30 years experience and total experience. And this employee will be flagged in the 30 years um, experience column of the report. So again, go ahead and have, you know, have your districts run it, take a look at it, get familiar with it, how it's running. Um, hopefully um, us having these down here will help them determine um, how, how the employees are being pulled in on it. Okay. All right. Um, and I think at the bottom here, it just has the total of, of employees also too. So I think that could be helpful if they're looking for how many employees are coming up to retirement for a certain year. They can see that. Okay. The next one is the new option that we have out there is to print the W-2C forms that now that we have. Again, you can find this under W or new reports under W-2C corrections. And then um, W-2 reports and submission. So once you have your records created here in this grid, then you can go to the corrections, the W-2C report and submissions. This is kind of just like it is when you're running W-2s. Um, you have that two places where you run it. And then it goes to this other part where you have the output file. So it's kind of the same thing. It's following the same as these, as your W-2. So first, we have the option here, you can run a report. If you want to run a report for everybody that was just in that grid that I just showed with those three employees, or you can run it just for one employee in that grid if you want to. And I did run a, a report. Here it is right here. So you can see this is what the report looks like. So it will show if what was original, what is corrected. So they can double check. So like mine was, I just, uh, one of them was the corrected code for the vehicle lease. The original was zero and we forgot to put the $500 in for that employee. So now um, this is what that report is showing. So they can double check that before they actually run the form to make sure that's correct. Again, if they have many um, employees that are on this and they have a sort option that they wanna use, they have different sort options here that they can go ahead and run it by. Um, again, they can do start a new employee on the report page if they like, if they like to divide that up to make it look nicer so they can read it easier. If they have like 50 employees, they can have that option. So now once we run the report is done, now we can run the form. Now when you run the forms, you can't run it by, you know, separate pages. It's just that disappears. And then I'm going to generate the form. Again, you'll get that message down here. Info generated forms can be found on the WTC form output files view. So then we want to go back here, go to the W2C form output files, and you'll see my one that I just ran for 934. It's going to create a zip file. And you open that up. Now they can run and create and print that um, PDF off for that employee and give to that employee, okay? And it prints, uh, how many copies? Say I have employee copy, 
federal return, employees. You have your state, city, or local. And then to be filed with the employees, federal. So it does give you all the ones just like uh, what a, um, a W2C would be. Okay. And you can see the vehicle lease right here that I added. And it adds the information and it adds the employees. Um, and it um, should have all that information on there for you. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So also you can, um, once you can take this file and, and send it to the file archive. So once you do that, it's going to remove it from this grid. So you know that you already printed it off and you can send it. And then you'll see here, the zip to payroll file is sending to the payroll file archive and it's under the calendar year reports for 2023. So if I go to the file archive now and go to calendar year, we'll see the one I just sent right here. So now it's there for later use or, okay. And again, if you put them out there by accident and you just want to remove them, you also have the option to delete them. Okay, any questions on the W2C option that we have out there now? Okay. The next one is the new add memo option for email direct deposit notices. Before we added just the memo to be for payroll payments um, and not the actual email direct deposit notices themselves. So now when they're processing direct deposits, they'll have that email um, memo. So now they can put on there something happy Friday or something. And then when they send that um, email out with those direct deposit notices that will print on their direct deposit notices now. So that has been added. So now they can um, use it um, when they process payments. And now it's been added for the email. Okay. So that takes care of our improvements. Um, the patches were just the ones that um, were behind the scenes, so I won't go into those because um, really I didn't have anything um, like migrating the photos and stuff like that. So it was just all behind the scenes stuff. Okay, any questions on anything that we went over for payroll for September? Okay. Um, I will go ahead and send it over to Michelle, I believe. Thanks, Andrea. You're welcome. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Can't believe we're in October already. Where is this year going? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss um, the release that went out in um, September regarding uh, inventory, we had one uh, regular release that was done. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of the improvements uh, that we did, but first um, the bug fix. Um, there was an issue with, if there was a null value in the password lifetime field, that field is stored on the system configuration, the password configuration screen. Um, and so I was preventing it from um, loading that screen when it had a blank in that field. So we fixed that. <clears throat> um, but the improvements that we did, um, we did do some improvements with the system. Um, I'm just going to move my chat over here quick. Um, with the user, we updated it to require a valid email address. If they're trying to check the two factors factor authentication. Um, so it is requiring a valid email address um, if they want to use the, the two-factor auth, auth. So um, 
that was um, fixed. And that was kind of a, a, well, yeah, I guess it's more of an improvement. Um, and also um, preventing users from logging in without a specified role. Um, we noticed that a user account could be created without a role. So we've updated that as well. Um, as for the reports, um, these two options were things that have been requested uh, several times. And the one is, and we just did this on the non-GAAP reports, um, they determined that the GAAP reports probably didn't need this information um, or these new features as much as the non-GAAP reports did. And so what we did is we added the ability to select um, single or double spacing. So we added the double spacing on onto the majority of the non-GAAP reports. And we also added the ability to generate a CSV file. So I kind of wanted to take you through those. And so if I go to um, my uh, instance here, um, I'm on the brief asset listing report. So I went into reports and I just clicked on the brief asset listing. And if I scroll down, these new options are going to be down at the bottom of all of these reports. Um, you'll see, the double space option here, and you'll also re uh, see the report format. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pick on certain things. Let's say I pick on capitalized assets that are active, and let me sort it by O oh, asset class. And so that's what my brief asset report is going to be. And so from here, I want to double space it. So let's do that first. Now, double spacing is tied to the PDF format. It isn't um, tied with the CSV. So um, what it will do then is generate like a double spaced report in the PDF file. So let's take a look and see what we get. So here is what it looks like now. It's just separated. There's a little, you know, more of a space issue there in between um, the um, actual items. So it looks um, a little bit easier to read. Uh, not everything's condensed together. And so that's basically how that report is going to look in the PDF format. Now, if I go back and I select the CSV file, um, you can leave this um, on here, if you want, it's not going to have any effect on the CSV file, or you can, you know, uncheck that. But everything else, you know, still remain the same though report. So I'll go ahead and generate my CSV file, and we'll take a look at that. And what I really wanted it to show, and it's not showing, I don't know if it's my Zoom or what, but... <laughs> Oh, that's too bad. Um, but anyways, um, oh, here we go. Just took a little bit. Um, you'll see this pop up. Now, when you think about it, if you're extracting information basically from that report into a CSV file, my first concern is leading zeros, right? Your tag numbers might have leading zeros. Um, your fund uh, might have leading zeros, asset classes. And so you'll get this um, prop now and it says by default, Excel will perform the following data conversions in this file. And by default, it will remove the leading zeros. Now, if I don't want to remove those leading zeros, which right now it did when I'm looking at it, um, and if I wanted to keep it that way, I would say convert. But if I want to retain those leading zeros, I want to select don't convert. And what it will do then is it will populate the leading zeros. So these tags are showing in inventory like this one here as 091267. So if I want to keep that format in the CSV file, I want to say don't convert. So it retains that information. Um, and so if I kind of spread this out here to see what it looks like, um, I must have a really long description here, but you'll see that, you know, it, it does it in a pretty um, nice, clean format here. And so with this one here, I said I want to sort it by asset class. So here are my asset classes. If, you know, my tag numbers, I don't like them to look this way, that's an easy fix. I can go up and select text and everything will line up properly. Um, but you can see that everything's kind of moved over again. Any other type of leading zero type of things or, or stuff, I may want to go in and set those columns as text as well. But it's pretty clean. So here are all my land and land improvements. 
tags. Here are all my building capitalized tags. So this is basically what that CSV file looks like. So um, I think that'll work out pretty nicely um, with, um, you know, with the districts having the ability to have the CSV files. Now, I know that we did have a report of somebody stating that I think it was the book value um, was kind of um, not all the fields were showing on separate columns of the report. Um, and so I have put that on to discuss at our next sprint meeting um, to discuss the book value. And I went and looked at the rest of the non-GAAP reports and it looks like we have uh, maybe the asset listing by source as well, where, you know, it's like column A on the book value is showing not only the tag number, it's showing like the, the function code and uh, a description on there. So you really can't sort by tag number because you have really three different fields in that column where they should be all separate. Um, so um, we're going to talk about that and they'll probably create a Jira issue to get that fixed so that, you know, the book value and the asset listing by source have, has everything in a separate column, just like, you know, this uh, report does. So the brief asset listing. Yes, I agree, Jake. Those changes would be very helpful. I know that uh, the book value... Um, is probably uh, you know a big one that they want to go in and and do some sorting and stuff like that on there, or maybe comparing that to something else. Um, so um, one other thing I wanted; those are the only two um, updates that were made, improvements that were made. Um, and like I said, they were made to the non-GAAP reports. I've updated the documentation. Uh, let me go in there to include um, all of these new options. Um, so those are all listed in here now. Um, but one thing while we're in here, um, I wanted to let you know that um, just like um, Andrew was talking about, um, I think it was the uh, eligible to retire report and um, how, you know, at, down at the bottom, she explained how they get those figures. Well, I, we kind of did the same thing with the gap reports, made some updates on the gap reports. So there's a lot more information here on how amounts are included on the reports. Um, and also, um, especially the fixed asset by source report. So we've created a few more links and also what happens when you have unknown funds or undetermined type of areas on each of these reports. So we kind of explained that a little more detail. So, you know, for districts, for auditors, that they can see where this information is coming from. And a lot of this was taken from the PowerPoint that was done in the inventory overview back in March. So for example, on the fixed asset um, by source report, um, there is an area now down here at the bottom that details how are the amounts included on the report based on what. And so we have examples of, and it's really, you know, the fixed asset by source is by the source fund, by the account code, this what it was purchased from. So, um, and so it's going to look there first to see what fund was used to purchase this item, not where it's currently being used. You might have purchased it from a grant fund, but it's being used in the elementary school. So, um, so the acquisition will show that uh, grant fund here. And, but if it's not there, and this could be because they didn't put the information in um, when they did the acquisition, or maybe it migrated over this way because they didn't have that information in Classic. But it's going to explain, you know, if you don't have a fund in the account code, what does it do? You know, if you do have a fund in the account code, what does it do? So it explains really four scenarios and how the information appears on the report. So we kind of went through and uh, put that information in here. Also, if you're running these reports, we've, and it's all the gap reports, um, you may have um, 
areas in the report that show unknown funds. Where are those coming from? And so this explains um, how to locate those and how to correct them. Um, so, and that's totally up to the district. You know, if they're good with having a large number in the acquisitions prior to system startup and they don't want to change that, it's probably like that in classic and it moved over, migrated over that way in uh, inventory. But um, if they do want to clean those up eventually, they can based on uh, what we have listed here. So it goes in and explains um, those areas. And each one of the gap reports has these areas in them. Um, we've improved the fixed asset by class report and just went into a little more detail about each of the options um, that you can run in that report. And again, included more information about these undetermined or if you see an actual um, invalid function area on the report, why? Where is that coming from? Um, and so basically, this is how you locate that. You can go into the items grid and filter by that particular asset class, 0101. And, you know, and if when you go in and do that, and then you sort by function, the ones that are blank and you sort by ascending order are going to appear first on the grid. So you'll be able to see immediately the tag number that has the blank function. Once you go in and create a transfer transaction to update that function, it'll remove it from this invalid function area and place it in the correct function area on the report. So it's just stuff like that that um, we've updated in here. Um, we've also made improvements to the schedule of changed and fixed assets. I was uh, looking over the documentation and just tweaked it, just added, beefed it up a little bit. Um, in regards to, you know, when you have, um, again, uh, the different, I'll go down here, um, the different columns on like the summary report per se, where are those coming from? You know, how do you get to the ending balance? So that's all been explained in here. Um, what if you change, you um, the information on um, added an additional acquisition to an item, thus changing it now to a capitalized asset. What happens on the report uh, when you do that? So it's just these type of things are explained in here. Um, if you run the capitalization criteria underneath the system menu, how does that impact uh, this report? So that's all explained in here. So we did a lot of beefing up on that so that you know, that information's out there for the user and for the auditors as well. Um, so we put that out there. What else did I want to cover with you guys? Um, do you guys have any questions about that or about the inventory updates at all before I move on to the next thing? Okay. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about, I know Andrea uh, showed you guys the new W2C information. Um, so I know we're getting close to calendar year end and on November 11th or 10th, we're going to do our calendar year end review for USAS and payroll. And um, last year when we went through the calendar year end review, um, especially payroll, a lot of information there. And we felt like, you know, combining the steps to close out for the calendar year and the W-2 printing, submitting, submissions, archiving um, of the reports was a lot in one session. So this year we are separating that out. So we are going to be doing, you know, go through the checklist, but then we're going to dig deeper into the actual W-2 information on the following week, the 17th. And we're going to cover more of the um, W-2 part of that. Um, that way, it's not all in one session, not part of the calendar year end. Um, but what we've decided to as well is in the beginning of 2024, we'll be doing a Fridays with Fiscal session on the W-2C. So we didn't want to throw that in with the W-2 because that's just too confusing. Okay, are we talking W-2s or are we talking about W-2 corrections? Um, so, and because most of those corrections are happening, you know, after submission, you know, January, beginning of February, um, we have decided that we'll hold off on the W-2 and definitely do a training with all of you 
Um, but we're going to do that after the, the calendar year end. Um, so we'll be doing that probably more near the end of January, uh, beginning of February. We haven't set a, a date for sure on that, um, but um, that's what we're gonna do. So the W-2s definitely will be discussed on the 17th, and then the W-2C information will be discussed after December. So do you guys have any questions about that? Okay. So we're winding down here. Um, so these are all the uh, sessions that we have left here for the calendar year. Um, we will start um, um, looking into you know stuff for the new year and getting the sessions around. Last year, we um, did a survey and sent that out to you guys asking what kind of sessions you'd like to see in the new year. So we'll be doing the same thing again. That'll be coming out here hopefully within the next month or so. Um, just getting your feedback on what you guys would like to see. It uh, might be a good idea, you know, when we do that survey is to look back at what we did in 23. And if some of these are like, you know, it would be great to have kind of a repeat session of that. I mean, budgeting doesn't hurt to, to hear that every year. Obviously, um, like new contract information doesn't hurt to go through that every year. So, um, so yeah, so if there's some things where, you know, that stuff will be on the survey, but it might just be a good idea to look past um, what we did in 23. And you can even look in 22 and see, oh, we haven't done this one since 22. And some things have changed. Maybe we need to go through that again um, as a group. So, um, so that's where all of that um, you know, that's what's coming up on the horizon is uh, getting that survey out to you guys. Okay. Well, if you guys don't have any further questions, um, you guys have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you soon. Thank you.